This morning's call comes to us from Psalm 128. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace upon Israel. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Let's pray. Indeed, Lord, we give thanks to you for your loving kindness is everlasting to those that fear you. Open your gates this morning, Lord, the gates of Zion, that we may enter and give thanks to you. We desire to dwell in your house, Lord, all the days of our life, for your, indeed your blessings overflow beyond all measure. And you are the good shepherd, and we are the sheep of your pasture. Guide us, Lord, into paths of righteousness. Today, open, Lord, our hearts to hear your voice. Give us hearts to hear more of how, uh, more of about your steadfast love that you have for us, your people. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And this is after Rachel just warned me not to walk up when I'm not supposed to, so I'm supposed to... <laughs> See? You were right. I should, write that. I should have written that in the margin. Don't walk off the stage. All right. So, uh, so please now uh, join with me in our responsive reading from Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it in vain... The Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sheep. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's love. Of one's youth Blessed is man who fills his quiver with them. He should not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Now it's uh, here. It's time for our prayer of confession, and then as a reminder, we we come before not our judge, but before our loving Father who does want us to come and to confess to him, and we have that hope of knowing that, uh, that he will also bring us forgiveness. So if you would please uh, re recite to me with me together the confession. Lord Jesus, I have sinned times without number and been guilty of pride and unbelief and of neglect to seek you in my daily life. My sins and shortcomings present me with a list of accusations, but I thank you that they will not stand against me, for all have been laid on Christ. Deliver me from every evil habit, every interest of former sins, everything that deems the brightness of your grace in me, everything that prevents me taking delight in you. Amen. Now take a few moments of silent confession. Here now the assurance of pardon from 1 Peter chapter 2. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. <laughs> Oh. 
Pray with me. Lord, in, indeed, we, we live in a, a time and a, a moment in history of great uncertainty and turmoil, at, at least in our, in our recent history, Lord, uh, for us here in this country. You know, each morning we, we wake and there's some, always some new anticipation of some new dread or, or concern that might come upon us or weigh upon us. And all about us we see, Lord, the uncertainty of this uh, virus that's among us and how we see the pandemic uh, causing prolonged illnesses and taking the lives of, of the weak and, and the ones that are most certainly loved by others. And and the heartache that comes with that. And we even have concerns, Lord, about, well, is it going to have any, you know, long-term ramifications for our health? And, and there's so many things that we don't know, and, and uncertainty overwhelms us, Lord, and uh, it frightens us at times. And even more frightening, Lord, is we, we see brutality in our streets, evil and the neglect that come from those that are supposed to bear the sword of justice and innocent lives being taken, neighbor upon neighbor, even in these very streets around us, Lord, we, we see uh, wickedness and evil. And there's so much civil unrest and destruction and repaying evil with evil. And our fears and our worries, well, as our vengefulness at times and even our anger speak of the inclinations of our hearts and tell us a good deal about about ourselves even and how we desire peace and we want things to be controlled and all this to disappear and go away and and we're reminded lord that they are not within our power and so often we forget lord of the good things you have taught us so that you call us to be peacemakers we're to love our neighbor even even when they're our enemy lord and we are to look to you for comfort and strength. For indeed, Lord, you are our good and perfect Father, our King. And you're good to us, Lord, even in our weaknesses. And you are patient. You are the, such a patient Father that wants to hear our cries, our frustrations, our worries. And indeed, Lord, we, we come to you today with those worries and, and ask that uh, you take and heal the land, heal heal hearts, uh, mend relationships. Uh, help us to play a role, Lord, in, in bringing people once again together and giving them the hope of, of, a, of a Savior. Uh, for, Lord, you have promised to always be with us and to never leave us. You have told us there indeed that there will be trials, even severe trials, Lord, but you've told us that you will be with us even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So we ask, Lord, that indeed this morning you bring us to your feet, teach us from your word, and give us ears to hear with open hearts from your faithful ministers. Show us, Lord, how to love one another. Show us, Lord, how to seek unity and work as one. May the way, may the way, may the way that we, your church, show love to, to one another and to our neighborhoods be a beacon of light to our communities. Guard our hearts, Lord. Guide our hearts, Lord, on how we can and should be loving our neighbor. Get us from behind our keyboards, Lord, and into our neighbors' lives so that we can begin the hard work of loving one another and loving them. And especially, Lord, just convict us to even pursue those neighbors that we, we at times, really don't even want to love. Because we're reminded, as your word reminds us, that where would, we, where would we be if we treated such as the way that we want, if you treated us the way that we, at times, want to treat others? For you did not forsake us even when, uh, and you pursued us even when, you were, when we were your enemy, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord. And we ask for your forgiveness for how we don't take seriously as we should our, our call to, to love our neighbor and even to love enemies. We also ask, Lord, that you show us how to pursue justice and righteousness in a fallen world. Guide, guard our leaders, Lord, to make wise laws that mirror your righteousness. 
for what your law teaches and tells us, Lord, is good and what we need in order to, to, to live, live in peace. And, to, and we know, Lord, that apart from you, that uh, it will only lead to more turmoil and evil. Even when we as a land pursue things that we think seem right in the eyes of the world, Lord, but we know, Lord, that if, if we don't have you at the center of our, how, we, how we live with our neighbors and live in community, even live as a nation, that uh, it will all be for naught. And uh, so we also, Lord, that we also ask, Lord, that indeed that you be calling your people to, to, to serve in our police forces, our government, and, and even in our courts. We also ask, Lord, that for those that already serve, that are already serving faithfully, that you comfort and strengthen them during these trying times. And remind them, Lord, that they work in the service of the true King, working all things together, that are part of your working out of all things to together for the good of, of your people. For indeed, Lord, you, you are a king that shows steadfast love, the one who has brought us salvation, who understands our trials and sufferings, our comforter who pours out blessing upon blessing. And it's in the name of our Savior and our King that I do pray. Amen. Well, thank you for having me today. Um, as Steve mentioned, I was here once before. Um, that was the week of youth camp. So there were about as many people here today as there were then as well. So I'm used to kind of the, the small crowd uh, here at Trinity, but I'm really grateful to be here. Um, I want to thank those of you who are here in person. Um, and I want to thank those online for joining us as well. Um, church is not easy right now. Um, and it seems like it's not uh, its fullest expression of joy either. So. Um, it is good to be gathered together in the spirit, though. Amen. Amen. All right, let's, uh, well, let me first give one more little bit of introduction. Like, like Steve said, I am from Indiana. Both me and my wife are from Indiana. Um, I do campus ministry, IEPUI. I am through one full year cycle. However, that one full year was sort of a three-quarter uh, capacity cycle. Um, the campus shut down uh, during spring break. Um, so if I could actually just have all you guys pray, maybe sometime this afternoon, for students going back to classes in the fall, um, and particularly as uh, me as well as many other campus ministers try to reach out to them in the name of the gospel, it's going to be a challenging time. Uh, I don't know if uh, many of you guys were involved in campus ministries, but part of the fun was the fellowship, right? Or you came in contact with those campus ministries from somebody on campus, talking to you, and I won't really be allowed to go on campus without some pretty serious restrictions. Um, it's the same with many other campus ministers. So pray that the Spirit would be at work um, on campuses this fall. Um, I'm, I'm still waiting on, on wisdom on how to proceed, um, but uh, I know that the Lord is going before me. So I'd be really grateful for that. Um, now, let's turn our attention to the Word of God. Um, if you would please stand... Uh, and open, there should have been an insert with Psalm 46 that you can follow along with. Um, if not, you can open your device um, to Psalm 46. To the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to the Alamot, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There's a river whose, make, whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. 
I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Would you bow your heads and pray? Father God, we come to you wary, even as, and especially on a Sunday. Um, you've called this your day of rest, but we don't really know what your rest feels like because it's so difficult to be still. We prefer our own way. Make this psalm our heart's posture today, God, though. Allow us to be still and know that you are God. Amen. You can have a seat. Mm, I love coffee. It's delicious. One of my favorite parts of waking up in the morning is coffee. Actually, one of my favorite parts of being awake at all is coffee. Um, did you know that there's an average about, of about 90 milligrams of caffeine in a standard cup of coffee? Now, 90 milligrams alone is probably enough to get you prepared for the day. But I recently learned that for most adults, you can realistically have about 350 milligrams before you cross this tipping point into what experts call adverse effects. And I don't really know what that word adverse means, but it's not scary enough for me to avoid them. Um, disclaimer, though, if you are experiencing adverse effects, uh, talk to your doctor. Um, I'm not that bad, though. I probably average around 270 milligrams or about three cups a day, and maybe less if I actually got a full night's sleep the night before. But what is caffeine actually doing inside me? How does it make me feel so good? It seems mysterious. Well, I did a little research. Um, the caffeine molecule, it mimics a molecule called adenosine. And adenosine is a chemical that inside your body, it, it's naturally produced. And it's responsible for helping your body go to sleep or uh, to help your body feel itself becoming tired. It's a sleepy chemical, okay? Um, and caffeine comes in to your body and it attaches itself to those adenosine receptors. So your body puts out the adenosine just as much as it normally does, but it has nowhere to go because the caffeine is block blocking the adenosine receptors. So your brain doesn't actually get the message that you're ready for a break and that you need rest. And for the longest time, I thought that caffeine worked by either speeding me up or slowing time down. Um, I'm not really sure. One way or another, I thought I was becoming superhuman, increasing my capacity to get more done in, in a day or making myself more high capacity like the people that I like to compare myself to. But that's really not what's happening. Instead, all caffeine is really doing is just making my body incapable of knowing what its designed limit is. It doesn't receive the message that I'm exhausted. I'm forcing my mind and my body to forget that it should stop. And now, when I was reading online, it, it seemed to convince me that uh, that isn't really that big of a deal. Eventually, we do fall asleep, or we do recuperate, or we do get our work done, or whatever. Um, now, there are some people who develop uh, blood pressure effects or maybe digestive issues, but humans are generally pretty good with this level of caffeine inside them. But I'm actually a little bit more skeptical than that, uh, because this uh, forgetting of myself being tired, it sounds a lot like what's going on, not just in my mind, but also in my soul and in my spirit. What are the long-term effects of operating beyond your own threshold? Well, these last few months, I think the bill came due. I've started to see it take a toll on me and on others. I've become more irritable, had a harder time staying focused. I find myself just wiped out for like days at a time. That's pretty immediate, just these last couple months. But even outside of the quarantine times, I think a lot of us can relate to the feeling of guilt for not being there for somebody who needs you because you had too much to do. Or that feeling that you're just constantly behind and you can't get on top of your work. You can't catch up. Or maybe when somebody asks you how you're doing, your response is, oh, I'm just so busy. Well, this sermon and this psalm are for when I'm spent, for when you are spent, for when you've been surviving on coffee for too long beyond your limit, and you're witnessing the mountains crashing down, and now you don't know what you can do about it. Psalm 46 is for when you are spent. 
And the thesis statement that it has for when you are spent is that God is bringing the new city to us so that we don't have to. A couple notes on Psalm 46 then. Um, First, Psalm 46 is a worship song, actually, that's sung by the whole congregation. Um, We learn in the prescript to the psalm um, that it is, in fact, a song. Um, Some psalms only say uh, when he fled from his son Absalom or of David or something like that. Um, But this one is a song, and it's meant to arise from and apply to every heart in the people of Israel. And that's important because it, it speaks to the universality of this psalm. You might call it a psalm of the people because it relates to everyone's experience of the world. But secondly, this psalm assumes a deep level of crisis. Look at the text if you have your uh, sheets close. Um, verse 1 talks about times of trouble, right? But trouble could be a bad day at work. Um, verse 2, though, I think is, is raising the stakes. The earth gives way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. And that is not your average bad day. The Bible is talking about your foundations being destroyed and ripped out from underneath you. It's talking about what happens after you've reached your limit. Or when the things you've been depending on are suddenly no longer dependable. It might be what you're feeling now. Like the lid has been ripped off and life is now chaos for you. You may wonder, how much more honestly has to happen before Jesus comes back? (laughs) Um, Maybe your summer looks a lot like my summer, if you feel like that. Many are acquainted with this feeling right now. And the reason that we feel this way, I think, or maybe one of the reasons, is that there's not much of a correspondence between our statements or our actions, what we're doing, and then the, the consequences for those things. I feel kind of like Hume almost, skeptical, like cause and effect are, are just figments of my imagination. Um, a couple examples. Students. You worked hard in school and then had no celebration at the end of the year. Your summer doesn't look like any other summer. And for seniors, you had no prom, no open houses to go to, no stage to walk across. Or on the other side, You're a teacher who saw progress in your students' learning objectives. And in spite of your own efforts, they stagnated at the end of the year because Zoom is no replacement for in-person teaching. All that work has gone to waste. Up seems like down. Down is up. The mountains are crashing into the sea. The earth is giving way under your feet. Psalm 46 is a psalm for the troubles of 2020. But even though it's a psalm for the troubles of our day. It isn't a psalm about the troubles of our day. It's more the context for them. It's a psalm about God bringing this new city to us so that we don't have to. Again, let's go to the text um, to show how God is bringing this new city to us. First, if you scan the whole psalm, Um, You can feel free to do this while I'm talking, even. Um, God is the only active agent in the entire psalm. God is within the city. God helps the city. God lifts his voice. He's with us as our fortress. He brings desolations. He makes wars to cease. He breaks the bow. He shatters the spear. He speaks on and on. Um, So this is a psalm clearly about God doing something. God bringing the new city to us. But secondly, and I think in support of this, there are only two imperatives in the psalm, things for us to obey. One of them is come and see what the Lord has done, which again kind of builds on my previous uh, statement, doesn't it? Um, That God is the one who's active. We're just to come and watch what he's done and to be still. Okay, so just be still. Sounds easy enough. But I don't think it's that easy. The reason we drink coffee is so that we don't have to be still. In fact, we cannot be still, even though our bodies and minds would prefer it if we were. And the after effect of not being still is precisely this feeling of being spent that I think we're going through right now. Blaise Pascal once wrote, 
All of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. And it's really, really uncomfortable to be still when we see things that need to get done, right? So we find ways to make up for the things that we don't see God doing. We live our lives in this constant state of, like, code orange, and it eventually wears us out. What is a code orange? I'm glad you asked. Um, If you're around my age or older, you probably remember 9-11. You might have a recollection of where you were, who was around, or even the images you saw on the television while the towers were still standing but smoking. Now, I remember there was a blue sky with gray smoke coming out of the side, and it was frightening. And in the weeks and months following, the government formed the Department of Homeland Security. The goal was to prevent this ongoing threat of terrorism, and they had this color-coded advisory system that would let the whole country know how much anxiety they should be feeling about another terror attack. Um, And it went green, blue, yellow, orange, and red. It lasted until 2011 when they disbanded this system, um, and it alternated in the entirety of existence between yellow and orange. It lived in that space. One time for about four days, it uh, went up into red, um, but then went back down. So when your advisory level is yellow or orange with brief segments of red for an entire decade, you kind of become numb to code orange, don't you? I'm guessing that by 2011, nobody really cared what the threat level even was anymore. It was almost like the boy who cried wolf a little bit. Um, So if everything is code orange, in other words, what in the world are green and blue supposed to be like? I think many of us have been living our entire lives in a state of orange. We've been drinking coffee to increase our capacity. And all it's done is made us forget that we need to be still. And in the words of a friend in campus ministry, We've all been working so hard to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, that we've forgotten to listen to the words of Jesus. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Again, we've all been working so hard to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, that we've forgotten to listen to the words of Jesus. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I think that's true, and I think it's because we've been shaped, like me, ever since I was a little boy even, um, that we've been working for everything, everything that we have. In our country, whether explicitly in something like the American dream or implicitly by just constantly measuring ourselves against the standards of success and achievement of others, we're riding on these rails of progress. And we can't blame our sin at all on living in America, but it does, I think, help to make sense of why I desire to work so badly all the time. Workaholism is one of those respectable sins in the United States. So progress and human achievement are totally impossible without the work of society and the individuals which comprise it, or so we're told. Um, Nothing is given, everything is earned. We are, after all, endowed with the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but that pursuit has turned a little bit more into a life sentence than a privilege. But onward the wheels turn. We keep progressing and progressing. And I think in the U.S. and even in greater Indy, we've probably seen these wheels carrying us forward. Our work ethic pays off. We've seen our city, our neighborhoods, our families, our lives, our academic achievement. It's all changed for the better when we work hard. But that progress isn't enough because there's still some problem to be solved, some homelessness, racial inequality, or we haven't just gotten to the salary that we we really want yet. We've put a vision of the good life in front of ourselves. And then we constructed that good life out of the raw material of our own weekly planners. So let me give a list of things here some times that we are tempted to become active and make the change happen. When we see the mountains falling into the heart of the sea, this is what we do. If you're either scared of becoming ill 
or frustrated of everyone else becoming scared of becoming ill. Be still and know that I am God. If you're a mother who's pushing your children to excellence so that they can attain the marks they need to get into the school of choice, be still and know that I am God. If you're a father who lost his job and have little hope of finding new employment because of the economic downturn, be still and know that I am God. If you are white and you're being told that uh, this is something that you have yet to process, maybe you're coming to grips with your privilege for the first time, maybe you're feeling pangs of guilt, be still and know that I am God. If you're a non-white family who's lost trust in powerful institutions to bring you the justice that you need, be still and know that I am God. If you want to progress, progress, progress in our society because you want to see it change so badly, be still and know that I am God. If you've been sharing the gospel for decades with your parent who's now close to death, but they don't show signs of receptivity, be still and know that I am God. Now, a little view behind the curtain. Um, if I'm being really honest, as I was planning this message, I really want to pull my punches. Because internally, I want to tell you, be still and know that I am God, but keep working for it. Keep working. Work, work, work. Press on toward progress in those areas. God still needs you. He needs me to be active in order to see justice in the world. He needs me to do it. I'm a slave to this work machine. But that isn't what Psalm 46 says. Perhaps we'll find another verse on another Sunday that will balance this out. But the fact is, I think God himself has placed Psalm 46 here. God's people gathered together here this Sunday. Psalm 46 is being preached today. Somebody needs to hear it. And I struggled personally to listen to it all week as I planned the words to say. St. Augustine said in his famous confessions, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Now this quote, it's actually saying an awful lot. First, it's obvious, I mean, right off the top, that our heart won't find rest in anything at all if that thing is attained by something other than being still and knowing that God is God. Second, and this one is easy to miss, is that this quote assumes that everybody is looking for rest. The desire to rest is ubiquitous. We're all made for God, every human, Christian and non-Christian alike. We all look for rest in diverse but equally unsatisfying ways. And in whatever way we do choose to search for rest, it provides just enough of this fix that we're distracted from the two, true rest that Augustine is talking about. As an example, if we all knew that drugs, for instance, wouldn't get you high, nobody would do them. But drugs and idols of all types provide just enough of a fix that we go back to them again, hoping that they're going to continue to provide what we're looking for over and over. And they don't. So therefore, we're all going to be spent at some point, whether early on in life or some as you're nearing the exit of this life, are working cannot get us where we want to go because of our sin. We eventually run into this law of diminishing returns regarding our own exertion, just like with a drug high. But the opposite is also true. If you don't feel spent, if you feel not spent, if you feel fine and content with your labors and the fruits that your work produces, watch out. Rest in God is only promised in the new city. And there's no guarantee that, that this work and these things that you're, you've stored up are going to carry over into that kingdom. 
Just like the parable of the rich fool in the New Testament who builds bigger barns for his abundant grain and then puts himself at ease, thinking he's good forever. So those who aren't feeling spent, please be on your guard against a false sense of satisfaction. But for the person who is spent, why should you take my word for it? <laughs> uh, this is going to be uncomfortable, right? Being still in the midst of a world that's falling apart. We want to climb out of this hole that we're down in. Why should we endure this comfort of being still? What's to gain if we actually follow and obey this text? Um, the answer isn't actually very gratifying. By being still, you might not gain rest in a certain sense in this life. Stillness, in other words, and rest are not equivalent. Just because you're being still does not mean that you've achieved rest. Stillness is, in a calculated way, putting yourself at the mercy of God when you have the urge to perform. Rest, on the other hand, is peaceful, satisfied, full, and you can't find it on your own. To put that all into one sentence, stillness is the posture that you put yourself in to allow God to grant you rest. Indeed, Jesus himself says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Slavery to Jesus is actually a tremendous release, even in this life, from the guilt of sin. But the real crescendo, and the point of Psalm 46, doesn't have to do with the blessings of this life. It has everything to do with the rest he's actually granting eternally. Take a look with me at verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. Now this, this verse, cast right in the middle, the heart of Psalm 46, is giving a future hope for a city that God dwells in. This city, it actually shows up multiple times in the Bible, but maybe the most exhilarating place it shows up is in Revelation 21. If you listen to the language as I read Revelation 21. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Now, Revelation 21, if you guys are aware, um, this is John's vision of what will happen when Jesus returns to claim his bride. There's this new holy city with God in her midst. And we know from the language of the Bible that bride means that the city is the people of God. God's presence will be full and it will be visible rather than hidden like in this present age. All the things that have currently worn you out, or beaten you down, or confused you, or have left you spent, they will be gone. All that will be left is the presence of God among us. And to close, if I can confess, I actually feel more spent now that I've spent the last 20 to 25 minutes talking than I did when I started. Um, my situation is unchanged. I'm going to have to lean into this promise for a new city this afternoon when I go home. But if I'm willing to be still, God will bring me a new type of rest that I have never experienced. And that future hope keeps me patiently, 
patiently waiting. God is going to have to be my fortress, as the psalm states, as I wait in stillness. And perhaps I need to fast from coffee for a little bit and let my body be still. Maybe we need to listen more intently to the signals that we're actually tired, overwhelmed. And maybe those feelings are actually a gift of God to know our own limitations and that God is still our God. It's not wrong to feel spent in in actuality. It might be the only correct response for when the mountains are crashing into the heart of the sea. Don't try in your own efforts to move the chains of history forward. It's a fruitless endeavor. Be still, because in stillness we become aware of our dependence on God for absolutely every good thing. And we recognize that we weren't made to have the fullness of rest in this life, but we will experience true, unending rest for our souls in the city of God. And we can invite others there with us. The river flowing through it, providing blessing for us all. You need only to be still. Let's pray. God, let us see what you have done, the desolations you're bringing on this earth, the wars you are ending. Be exalted among the nations and the peoples, O God. We will remain still, God, and watch you do it. For you are a mighty God, sovereign over all this earth. But make us into that new city and bring us there, God. We need you to do it because we need rest. We have constantly been searching for it and we haven't found it. Let us wait for that rest, the rest that Jesus has entered into following his resurrection. We can't wait for the day when you bring us into that rest as well, and we can trade in this feeling of being spent for feeling rested. Do this for your name's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our final song.